stuff. But... If you don't believe climate change uh, still exists, talk to a firefighter. And it's simple. When you take record heat, which is what the West Coast has seen this summer, you take the worst drought in at least a millennium over the past decade, you put those things together, you get these sorts of massive wildfires. Maximum sustained winds have been clocked at 150 miles per hour. And Laura is now one of the most powerful hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. mainland. This thing is about 400 miles in diameter. You just look around and there's water everywhere and you think to yourself, how is this reality? So whether it's the wildfires out west or the superstorms back east, we're seeing dangerous climate change play out before our eyes. Hi, everybody. I'm Al Roker, right now on the East Coast here in New York City. And I'm Savannah Sellers on the West Coast, outside of San Diego, both locations already battling the effects of climate change. You're watching Planet 2020. There is no question about the science. This year alone, we're on track to have the hottest year ever on our planet. Arctic sea ice continues melting at a record pace. And the Atlantic hurricane season? Well, it's advancing at a torrid speed. And while the U.S. is scheduled to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord in November, a bipartisan report just released says that climate change, quote, poses a major risk to the stability of the U.S. financial system and to its ability to sustain the American economy. The science tells us we have to act now. My hope? is that my kids' generation will pick up this fight since they're going to be the ones inheriting a planet on fire. The good news is that generation is already at work. Heads turned around the world last fall when then 16-year-old Greta Thunberg slammed leaders at the United Nations for their lack of action. All you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Inspired by Greta, some teens across the world skip school on Fridays, every Friday, asking why they're going at all if they won't have a planet left in the future. And in the U.S., an election looms, where millennials and Gen Z will make up 37% of eligible voters. And concern over climate change is rising sharply and shaping up to be more important to all voting blocs than ever before. Is it enough? Are we acting too slowly? And can we turn things around and cool our planet off? This is Planet 2020. Right now, coast to coast, thousands of people are displaced from their homes, feeling the immediate effects of the devastating climate events we're seeing these days. As for those people, they look for hope in the ruins. But scientists warn the worst is yet to come. 2020, a year of extremes. In January, wildfires erupting across southeastern Australia. In June, Siberia hitting 100 degrees. And right now, the western U.S. being ravaged by deadly wildfires and heat. And the Atlantic hurricane season? It's so active, the record books can't keep up. Chalk up these disasters to it just being 2020? Absolutely not. This is a dangerous trend that began back in the Industrial Revolution and has grown exponentially as we humans continue to release greenhouse gases. The last five years have been the hottest years on record on our planet ever. So what does it mean? It means that if the planet warms another two degrees, more heat waves, floods, and droughts are in store. But it doesn't have to be that way. There's still time to take action, live greener, get out and vote, and do your part. Blood orange skies and overwhelming smoke from wildfires had sadly become part of life for people here on the West Coast. And for many, they're still barely recovering from the last fire season. What is it like year after year? How hard is it to rebuild? Steve Patterson has that story. We left two hours before the house burned down. It's heartbreaking. Our younger son hasn't slept alone in his bed for one night in it'll, almost three years. Um, and that is a constant daily reminder of what we've been through. Both of our children, uh, their best friends lost their homes. Some of my closest friends lost their homes. 25% of our school community lost their homes. So 
It's such a unique situation to go through something that is so awful, but to go through it with so many people you know. Um, and there's something actually healing about that. So we felt really strongly that we needed to go through this with our community. If we'd moved back to San Francisco, they wouldn't know what we were going through. We also had her parents here. They lost their houses as well, uh, their house as well and we wanted to, to, to yeah. be together. We thought the best way was to all rebuild. I have to find something positive out of this. And what that is, is that we have each other. Yeah, that's all We have matters. our family, everybody's safe. Everyone that we know that's lost their home is safe. And it's just tough. We'll always have the memories. You know, the memories are gonna be there, but we'll build new ones. Yeah. We'll rebuild, we'll definitely rebuild. Yeah. Oh yeah. Tell me about um, starting fresh. What's it been like to rebuild on a place that, you know, was so destroyed? That's a tough question to answer. Yeah. I mean, where you start is having the debris removed. Then your mind goes to all of this toxic, burnt ashes, whatever else is in it. Yeah. They're carting it off, and in my brain, I'm thinking, oh, so now where are you going to put it? Do you feel any safer? I do feel safer. I mean, I, 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 I do. Yeah. It's more efficient? Much more efficient. Oh, gosh, yes. Know. Way more efficient. Yeah. Safer, that's a really, that's a tough word. Yeah. I, I think because I'm broken, you know, where the PTSD is, I don't know. I mean, that's I'm broken. You know, it's it's so darn sad. The size and spread of these fires now tearing through the West have already been historic, fueled by these high temperatures, low humidity, and powerful winds. It's not yet even the height of fire season. We have clear evidence from very careful, objective scientific research that global warming is elevating the risk of uh, wildfire in California and more broadly in the Western United States. Over the region as a whole, the uh, total area burn has uh, increased around tenfold in the last four decades, and about half of that increase is attributable to the effects of long-term warming on vegetation dryness. On a nationwide scale, we know that 84% of the wildfires across our nation are actually started by people. That's another piece of the puzzle that we can fix. So instead of smoky bear in the middle of the woods, we need a smoky bear in the middle of suburbia telling us that only you can prevent the fires that are threatening your homes. Today, nearly 80% of the homes that were destroyed here have been or are being rebuilt. And while the community is coming back, the pain still lingers. What goes through your head and your heart when you see this current spat of fires? that are burning not only in California, but now Oregon and Washington and all these other places that we haven't had before. It's a lot of disbelief that it's happening again, four years in a row now. Um, and to see again that it's now, we have the biggest fire in California. Um, after we had the biggest fire in California the year prior and the year prior to that. And it's also really re-triggering and re-traumatizing for those of us who've been through it. So it's almost like we never get a chance to heal because it just continues to happen. Well, you can't really do anything but keep an eye on it. It's tough, it's tough. It may happen yeah. every year for the rest of your lives. Exactly. You're this, prepared for that. This may be our new normal. Now, Al, I'm at the site of the Valley Fire outside of San Diego. Thousands of acres burned and look like this. Firefighters were injured and many homes and structures were lost. As we just heard in that piece there from Steve, it's just so devastating to try to build back from. Yeah, I remember being at the Paradise Fire and, and seeing whole neighborhoods wiped clean. So uh, only imagining again what those folks are going through. And, and we're seeing haunting images of destruction all over the globe, not just in America, but polarized views on climate change and the effect it has play into politics, despite the science. So what is the responsibility of people in positions of power? Gina McCarthy, the former EPA administrator in the Obama administration and current president and CEO of the Natural Resources Defense Council, joins us now. 
Uh, Dr. McCarthy, thank you for joining us. We so appreciate it. Al Savannah, it's great to be here with you. Uh, first off, our, our climate is being referred to as being in crisis. What do you see as the most urgent climate issue in front of us right now? Well, simply to take action. And the most urgent action we can take is to vote. You know, you're absolutely right. Everybody needs to be all in on climate. And the problem is we do not have the leadership at the federal level that's going to deliver the actions we need today to address our climate crisis. And there's opportunities for people today. Look, I know that at least me, I'm not happy with the lack of federal leadership. It disturbs me when we have a president that's sort of giggling. Um, at the site of total devastation that we're seeing in the western U.S., not to mention the hurricane season that we're facing with double storms just hitting and hitting and all the crazy wind storms in the Midwest. You know, we know everybody is being impacted by climate. We need leadership. We need new leadership who's going to recognize science, pay attention to us, and help us move forward. And, and honestly, every one of us has something we can do. We can take a look at our own communities. We have across the United States, while the federal government has done nothing but deny climate, pull out of the Paris Agreement, and roll back all the protections we had in place that would start addressing climate change, we now, we also have uh, governors across the country, more than 24 of them, who are all in on taking action in climate. We have hundreds of cities that are acting. We can work with those governors and with those cities, and we can express our rage and our demand for climate action by voting in November. That's the most important thing you can do if you're worried about the climate crisis that is impacting all of us. And honestly, Al, one of the most important things we can do is recognize that climate change isn't about the planet. We now know it's about people. It's about our health, our well-being, our safety. It is about the next generation. And while I want to see young people standing up and, and speaking up and protesting, I want to be with them every step of the way. Because I have two grandchildren myself, and there's no way I'm going to stop fighting uh, climate change until my dying breath. And all of us have to take that attitude, especially knowing that the people most damaged by climate change are uh, the very same people that have been most damaged in this pandemic. Everybody seems surprised that, that the black community was being hottest hit, but if you're in the environmental world, you know well that the poor in the black communities and the brown communities are always hit first and hottest with traditional pollutants, and they're, all, they're the ones most at risk in climate. So climate change is not just bad for us, but it's damn unfair. It actually is continuing the systemic racism that none of us want to see to continue. Now, Gina, you mentioned the importance of voting. And as a former EPA yeah. administrator, you know what those leaders are capable of. You know what government is capable of and what it's not. What role can and should government be playing in this crisis? Well, I think you have to look at government action at the federal, state, and local level, because we live in a democracy. The one thing I have learned is that the federal government isn't the innovator. The federal government has to be pushed every step of the way. Now, I know that Vice President Biden has a great climate plan. It's focused on equity, and it's focused on health and moving us forward. But I also know that, it, but that people have to not just vote, but they have to keep demanding that all those plans are put in place. That's why I'm at the Natural Resources Defense Council. We have to keep advocating. We have to communicate and work together. We have to demand more of our businesses, not just the fossil fuel companies, to step up and take ownership of what they've done, but also businesses everywhere have to start looking at how they're investing. Pension funds have to look at how they're investing. Make sure that we're divesting of the past dirty fuels that we're 
relied on and really go all in on clean energy. You know, the exciting thing about clean energy is that it doesn't just help us with challenges of climate change and pollution, but the most exciting thing is it's the way to get us out of the, the economic doldrum that we find ourselves. One of the biggest damage of all we're seeing on climate is that people are also facing an incredible pandemic. People are just beaten down. We need to stand up and say our future has to be clean energy. It's healthier for all of us. It will grow jobs. Clean energy has three times as many people working in it as fossil fuels. We need to have a just transition, but we need that transition to happen and happen now. So if we can all be all in, then we can grab our future once again, and we can deliver for those young people a, fu a future that we will be proud to hand to them. Gina McCarthy, thank you so much. We really appreciate your insight and your input. Savannah? There's no doubt climate change is going to be an issue on voters' minds when Americans cast their ballots this November. So how will Trump and Biden each handle this crisis? With November 3rd rapidly approaching, let's take a look at where both candidates stand on climate change. Since Trump entered office in 2016, he's consistently lowered environmental protection regulations, citing that they're crippling to the economy, including a historic departure from the Paris Climate Accord in 2017. I was elected to represent the citizens of Pittsburgh, not Paris. A departure that Biden plans to reverse immediately if he wins in November. While we're standing around not doing much, the rest of the world is moving ahead. First thing I would do the day one as president, I'd rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, which we, Barack and I, put together. Under Trump's leadership, the Department of the Interior proposed the largest ever oil and gas lease of over 78 million acres in the Gulf of Mexico. Trump also signed an executive order for the expansion of offshore drilling. Trump then reversed himself just last week off the coast of Florida and up the Atlantic coast. In a few moments, I will sign a presidential order extending the moratorium on offshore drilling on Florida's Gulf Coast and expanding it to Florida's Atlantic coast as well as the coasts of Georgia and South Carolina. A move he hopes might win him votes in the tough swing state. Biden, on the other hand, plans to ban any new drilling permits on public lands or waters. Instead, he plans to shift the country's focus to renewable energy options with a goal of doubling offshore wind by 2030. When Donald Trump thinks about renewable energy, he sees windmills somehow causing cancer. When I think about these windmills, I see American manufacturing, American workers racing to dominate the global market. Biden wants to create 10 million jobs focused on climate change and wants the whole country to be net zero in carbon emissions no later than 2050. Trump, meanwhile, repealed the Obama-era clean power plan that required states to cut emissions by 30 percent by 2030 and was expected to create as many as 560,000 jobs in the clean energy field. He claims it caused an increase in energy prices. Instead, he focused on preserving coal mining jobs and approving drilling along the Dakota Access and Keystone XL pipelines, the latter of which is still not completed. Today we take one more step in putting the jobs, wages and economic security of American citizens first. When it comes to the broader environment, Trump proposed a 26 percent budget cut for the EPA in fiscal year 2021. Meanwhile, Biden's team unveiled a $2 trillion environmental policy plan. It turns out public opinion is on the side of limiting climate change. According to a study released on August 24th, 68 percent of Americans believe that the U.S. government should be doing more to deal with global warming, a trend that the Biden campaign is banking on with their clean energy revolution. As Election Day grows nearer, we'll be keeping an eye on both candidates and their plans to fight climate change. Well, coming up after a quick break, what can we do to help our planet and help spark change? Stay with us. I started coming here before I can remember with my mother and my grandmother, and my grandmother's parents built this cabin in 1907. It was a two-story cabin. It had cut glass crystal windows in three of the bedrooms. It had these big redwood beams in the living room. We made a lot of ash. 
we would go from thinking it was gone for sure to being hopeful that it was still here. We know it was here for a day. And so it was a roller coaster ride of up and down. And when we finally saw the photographs from the embedded photographers that come up with the fire department, that was really helpful to actually know that it was gone. My daughters are very interested in rebuilding. They love it here. And I guess we will. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This is a situation where the state continues to struggle to expand its testing capabilities. Protesters feel that they need to come out in full force and support their community because they feel like they're not getting that support from the Portland police. Another election day coming up against the backdrop of how to keep voters safe amid a pandemic. The moment to truly understand who we are and who we say we are is right here at our feet. You gotta get a four-year degree, but a four-year degree is super expensive. We have created a system where the ticket to the middle class is a thing that middle class families have to stress about and borrow for and patch together. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Well, we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. This morning across the country, what the new normal for schools will look like. Many teachers left making tough choices between the job they love and their family. What am I going to decide? Take care of my children or have a job? That's an impossible decision. You're creating a little community school. This is a moment we can just develop ourselves and develop our community. Let's turn it over to students. How do they really feel about returning to school? What I miss is my teachers. They are resilient. A surge in coronavirus infection. New developments on several fronts. The story. Tonight, the U.S. shattering the record for most COVID cases in a single day. From every angle. What's your level of concern that the kids who have been told they're going to be home indefinitely won't be able to catch up? On the ground. Do you have faith that this is going to bring about change soon? And in death. Here in Portland, more protests expected tonight. Do you think that police in this country are under attack? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. The news business is dynamic and probably has never been more important. With all that we're facing, I am so proud to bring the perspective of a black woman, a daughter of immigrants, the wife and mother of a husband and kids who sadly are more vulnerable to police violence because of their color, a proud nerd, and a representative of the emerging America to cable TV news. I hope the great Gwen Eiffel and my mom, Philomena Carol Lamina, will look down from heaven and be proud. I hope is based in the youth. I see the world youth mobilized for very important uh, causes. I see them mobilized in relation to gender equality. I see them mobilized in relation to climate. I see them mobilized against racism. I see them mobilized for international cooperation. They are much more cosmopolitan, much more universalists than my own generation. And uh, it is this dynamism of the youth that makes me be hopeful, because let's be frank, my generation largely failed to address the challenges that the world faces, the youth seems to be much more determined to do so. Yeah, you know, we always look to our youth. Uh, do you, are you more optimistic because of this generation that's coming up? Yes. I think it's our best hope, is the generation that's coming up and that understood already, and we see it in so many ways uh, around the world, understood already that uh, either we are united or we'll be doomed. 
While the leaders in our country are divided, the younger generation is stepping up. They go out and strike. They don't mince their words when addressing world leaders. It is this generation that could be the key to caring for our planet. The climate crisis isn't something that we're going to have to deal with in the future. We are already seeing the effects of it right now. I was there when the campfire broke out in Paradise, California. We ended up receiving a lot of the smoke, and we had to do the same things that we did just in the recent weeks when the entire West Coast was on fire. We roll up wet towels and put them under windows and doors to keep the smoke from seeping in because it was inflaming my asthma. Um, I became very sick. Now it's like a repeat of that history for me personally. I am a 15-year-old climate activist and founder of Earth Uprising International. My thoughts on the whole Generation Z as the leader of the climate movement is a bit, it's a bit inaccurate because this is an intergenerational movement and young people are getting involved at bigger and bigger levels because we are seeing this impending climate catastrophe and we really feel that anxiety and we're being asked to plan for our futures but we have nothing to plan for and so then we feel really angered and motivated. My name is Jamie Margolin, I'm 18 years old and I'm a co-founder of the International Youth Climate Justice Organization Zero Hour. When I first got involved in climate activism what I told people was that in the future we won't be able to go to school because we'll be too busy running from the next um, climate fueled disaster. People told me I was being dramatic and I was being an alarmist but it hasn't even been two years since I started and we're already starting to see what scientists have been telling us for years if we were able to go to school at this time we still wouldn't be able to on the west coast because it's very unsafe for us that air quality causes all sorts of effects to your body it can cause health issues in the future but we aren't the ones who decide the city and federal budgets. We aren't the ones who vote on the bills. We aren't the ones who are actually in power to change things. From the summer of 2017 to the summer of 2018, we were working nonstop organizing and organizing to create youth climate marches in Washington, D.C. and what ended up being 25 cities around the world. We haven't really been ingrained in the system that a lot of adults are ingrained in. So we think outside of the box and we don't think about what's politically possible when it comes to actions to take about the climate crisis. We just think about what really needs to happen. I feel like people could often think like, oh yeah, what's the point? Why should young people even bother if we're not going to be heard? But I think that the answer is intergenerational organizing. We need the young people's energy and the wisdom of the elders and people who have been doing this together. We need adults backing us up in our activism. And so I believe that we are going to come out of this pandemic much stronger as a movement as a whole than before. While yes, like we are often dismissed, overall we have contributed to a massive cultural shift. We need climate action within the next 10 years in order to save our planet. Now, Al, I've had the pleasure of talking to so many of these both young and first-time voters. And what's so cool is that many of them identify as Republican, many of them identify as Democrat. This particular issue does not feel partisan. If anything, it maybe feels generational, and this generation just really seems to care across the board. You know, Savannah, I've got a 22-year-old who has uh, marched in the strikes, and I have an 18-year-old who's excited about voting for the first time and making a difference. Uh, well, successfully addressing climate change is going to require action and activism. So, so how do we truly make a difference in restoring our planet? One person helping to lead that fight, producer, actor, and environmentalist, is Ian Somalhalden. Uh, Ian, here's a question for you. What do, what do you see as the most urgent threat in the climate crisis right now? By the way, thank you guys for, for having me on. Listen, the, 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 the biggest urgent threat that we have is this carbon output that we, that we have up there, not just the legacy load of carbon, but what we're putting into the atmosphere every, every year. And that's why we f shot a film on it that took seven years to give a real understanding of how to get out of this simple solutions that actually work. That is what we're facing, is how do we not only to mitigate or minimize our carbon output, but actually draw down the carbon that is left in this legacy load of carbon. Because at the end of the day, we could take every car up the road, every maritime shipping vessel out of the ocean, or every plane out of the sky, shut down every coal-fired power plant there is, and climate change would still happen at an alarming rate. And that is because of agriculture and carbon. 
Now, Ian, like you just said, carbon emissions, this is this huge part of this conversation. You mentioned your film, that's this new doc Netflix documentary, Kiss the Ground. It focuses specifically on a way to do that, and it's really interesting, and I feel like a lot of people might not have heard of this until seeing this film, Sustainable Farming to Regress the Surplus of Carbon in the Air. Tell us specifically about what this film reveals and how you hope to contribute to combating climate change. Right, right. Thank you so much. Um, so it's it's called Kiss the Ground, and it's actually not even about sustainable farming. It's about regenerative farming. The whole idea that the only way to get rid of the amount of carbon we have in the air is to do it at scale, right? Other than, you know, oceans and massive, massive uh, areas of the land, of the world, the biggest areas are agriculture. So it's called biosequestration, otherwise known as drawdown, right, which is using growing plants and different ways of grazing animals to draw down all of that carbon through biosequestration, store it safely back in the ground where it belongs, all that carbon, and feed all the microorganisms. Because much like the human body, you know, our health, the health of a human being is completely based on the microbiome of our gut. The same thing with the earth, right? The microbiome of soil is how the earth heals itself. It's how the earth grows food that then pulls carbon out of the sky. So uh, unfortunately, modern agriculture is, was not designed for the betterment of the soil. So by changing the agricultural systems to regenerative farming, and here's the big kicker, and I'll say this very quickly, what no one, none of us actually ever understood, right? We took, it took seven years to make this film. I shot the initial footage of this film nine years ago in Zimbabwe. When we, and this is the big one that people just hate to hear, when we till soil, which is what we do every year, we release what? Carbon. No one thinks about that. When you damage soil, it releases carbon. So that's when everyone says, wait, what? So when we stop tilling our soil and we design our, our planning practices around no till, the world will shift on its axis. When China, Russia, the United States, India and the EU switch to regenerative farming practices, the world will shift on its axis and we will literally reverse climate change by 2050. That is exciting. This is not all doom and gloom. Hmm. Sorry, go ahead. But Ian, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, so I'm not a farmer. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't do farming. Who, who do you see as allies? How do we, who are not part of that process, uh, become allies? So it's a really great question. Listen, this is obviously an intergenerational um, movement, but I will say this, when millennials, Gen Zs, uh, even baby boomers demand that every piece of spinach they eat, every piece of broccoli they eat, or every chickpea they eat, every bite of cereal they eat come from a regenerative farm, every mall development, high school, college, uh, sports arena, you see what I mean? You can, we can do this at scale. So again, yeah. it goes back to empowered, conscious consumers. But every day that they leave their home, they have the ability to vote with their dollar. And that's the most powerful vote that there is. And are they going to be voting with that dollar to companies who are not just sustainable, but that are regenerative? And again, this cannot be something that, that drives the prices up, right? That's what happened with the whole organic movement. It's too expensive for families. You know, I grew up very, very poor uh, in the deep, deep south in Louisiana. Um, there's no way my family would have been able to afford, you know, organic food back then. And so the reality of it is that we have to make it affordable, which we can, because we can do it at scale. And this film offers real solutions that is just so exciting. I've seen 25 or 30 cuts of our film. There's not one time I've seen it where I'm not teary. And that teary is not just anger, it's hope. It's excitement. And that is what I think people will see um, on Netflix September 22nd. Now, Ian, you mentioned that this is an intergenerational fight, and that's, of course, because it's an intergenerational issue. It's something that affects all of us who are here on the planet. And if you don't mind yeah. me asking in a personal take on that, how does being a father, you know, I know you have a daughter, contribute to your commitment to this cause, thinking about her future? Well, that's the thing, right? That, that's what's so crazy about all of this is I was in this climate fight before I had a daughter. We have enough 
healthy soil left for 60 harvests. So that's 60 years of food. When I'm holding my daughter, I see her at three years old and say, in 60 years, you're only going to be 63 years old. I don't want a world where my child at 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60 is fighting because some new, you know, storm systems have, you know, completely, de you know, destroyed the entire eastern seaboard and the whole southeast. And there's mass, you know, uh, migration from the eastern seaboard and the southeast up to the north and midwest and, and northern uh, northwest of this country, which is where we're going. That's what the computer models say. Uh, and the, the, the biggest organizations, ultimately, that want this science and have the data is the United States military and the biggest insurance companies in the world, because they are actually at the greatest risk of loss. And so the science is there. It's the intergenerational um, buy-in, ultimately, that this is their time, because I look at what's happening in the youth of the world and how amazing it is and what Greta's been able to do. But here's my question. Who's financing these young ones? Who's organizing these young ones? Who's putting together the structure? You know, if you're thinking about massive global change from a policy level, from a corporate level, from an institutional educational level, it takes guidance, it takes structure, it takes finance. You know, that finance is not just going to fall out of the sky. We've got to do it through business, unfortunately. And that is, you know, for profits giving back and using not just sustainable business practices, regenerative business practices will ultimately change the world. And that is what is so um, exciting for me. And that puts the power into the people's hands, which makes them feel empowered, makes them feel part of the process and gives structure and finance to this whole thing that we're going to need to do at scale, you know? Well, well, Ian Summerholder, you have certainly give us, given us literally food for thought. We appreciate you sharing uh, your time. Thanks so much, my friend. Such a huge fan of you guys. Thank you for doing what you do. We love you. Thank you. Of course, fixing our planet isn't just about climate change. A key component, waste management. Carrie Sanders traveled to the Maldives back in February to see how they're working through this challenge. I'm more than 8,600 miles from New York in the Maldives, a country of 1,100 plus islands here in the Indian Ocean. And wow, stunning clear water, amazing beaches. It's why more than a million and a half tourists come here every year. But every tourist who comes here also creates a problem. An average tourist creates six pounds of garbage uh, daily, and that's quite a lot. The numbers are staggering. Tourists and residents produce a mind-boggling 636 million pounds of garbage a year. And this is where that garbage winds up, much of it plastic, 700 tons a day. 30 years ago, this was a small island with a lagoon and a coral reef. Today, it's three times its size, appropriately nicknamed Trash Island. The garbage is shipped to Trash Island on barges. The government here estimates 25% is lost overboard in the Indian Ocean. Add to that plastics carried here by ocean currents from other nearby countries. I went into the water to look. Along the reefs teeming with fish, we found some of that plastic garbage sinks, but most float, washing up on beaches which are littered in those plastics. To demonstrate the problem, I grabbed a burlap bag and started collecting. That's two and a half minutes of picking up plastic, and I see it as far as the eye can see. For years to prevent the growing plastic soup, just as we do here in the U.S., Maldivians tried recycling. At first glance, this looks like a success. This plastic will ultimately be recycled. But the government here in the Maldives has a different idea, to eliminate single-use plastics so they never have a mountain like this again. It was theatrical, but to make a point, the government in the Maldives held an underwater cabinet meeting. Eventually, a new law of the land here. By 2023, single-use plastics should no longer be available. No more bottles, bags, and baby diapers. Collectively, those three items make up 80% of the single-use plastic garbage. 
the inspiration for this countrywide undertaking comes from a garbage experiment on the Maldivian island of Suniva Fushi. The owners of a 100-acre resort hotel wondered how much could they reduce that six pounds per day per tourist. They first took aim at plastics, and the biggest enemy, the water bottle. With some false starts and a few dead ends, how's it add up? We've been able to reduce it to half a pound now. From six pounds to a half a pound? Yeah, exactly. That's less than a tenth of what had been dumped. The question, if widespread reduction in garbage eventually works here, could we in the U.S. follow? What's driving all of this? Is it just tree hugging? No, it's got to make financial sense. That's why our program is called the Waste to Wealth Program. And is it making you money? Is it saving you money? It's saving us money. And that dollars and cents success is why other hotels are beginning to do the same thing. All of it with the incalculable benefit of preserving this beauty, which of course is why tourists come here to begin with. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Suniva Fushi, the Maldives. Our thanks to Kerry and everyone who contributed to this important and clearly timely discussion. Al, the expert, I've loved joining you for this. Well, I loved having you and your, your, your outlook on this as well, Savannah. And in fact, no matter where we live, whether it's on a coast, the Midwest, we are all affected. The next generation is going to judge us by what we do today with climate change. Question is, is it too late to change that legacy? Well, we want to thank you so much for watching Planet 2020 and have a great day. The death toll rising in California as fires are spread across the state. National Hurricane Center called this historic, catastrophic flooding that is unfolding right now. It's not rocket science. There is only one thing that can explain why we are seeing such massive, hot, burning, intense wildfires. And it's the hot, dry conditions that are being created by climate change. Scientists have found that fires out west are 50 percent more intense and had the season has been extended by weeks as a result of human contributions to climate change. The reality of this is slowly but surely sunk in day after day. It gets a little harder, a, a little worse, so, you know, a little bit more. Oh, my God, is this ever going to end? I've been, been in multiple hurricanes, Katrina Gustav. I mean, this is it's part of living down here. You see all this damage. You see all this destruction. But you also people see the best in people right now. Everybody coming together to try to help each other out. And we're all just looking out to make it out to the next day, ready for the next sunrise. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. If they do go back to their jobs, they want to make sure that they are protected. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.